Gukesh has a superpower. Yeah, you heard me right. He's not just a genius, he's superhuman. You can say that this year's candidates had a lot of interesting things going on for it, but for sure, nobody was expecting to see history being rebuilt in the chess world. Nobody would guess that a 40 year record held by Kasparov was gonna be broken just like this. Gukesh became the youngest chess player to win the candidates, by far the youngest player. But now he has a gigantic chance to become the youngest world chess champion. All of this could be enough mind-blowing for a tournament, but this incredible guy keeps showing everybody how sturdy and resilient he is against all odds and despite some predictions of some very important fellas. For Gukesh, it's very hard to say. I cannot imagine him winning. I think he will certainly win at least a couple of good games, uh, but have some fairly bad losses as well. Gukesh is rewriting chess history. We're gonna explore how crazy is Gukesh's superhuman mind, the two games that changed chess forever, and how India is becoming the world's headquarters for chess geniuses. When I say Gukesh is superhuman, like out of this planet, I mean it. Even before being the youngest winner of the candidates, Gukesh was showing his brilliancy a long time ago. He is the third youngest grandmaster in history, the third youngest to ever become a super GM, surpassing the rating of 2700, and the youngest ever to achieve the rating of 2750. Before Gukesh, the youngest person to ever win the candidates was Kasparov at the age of 22. 40 years ago. Gukesh just beat his record by five years. And guess what? If he beats Dick Liren at the World Championship, he will dethrone Kasparov once again and become the youngest world chess champion. And this has been his dream since a little kid. Uh, what, what do you want to do when you grow up? I want to become the youngest world chess champion. You want to become the youngest world chess champion, yeah? yeah. Don't get me wrong. Kasparov is a legend and is still a watershed in the chess world. But now Gukesh is filling his shoes with mastery. Think of how this achievement will inspire lots of young players to hone and showcase their chess talents. Gukesh is rewriting what is possible in the chess world. And it's unnecessary to mention, but here it goes. We're talking about a kid that's breaking chess at just 17 years old. That is 17. He's a teenager. When I was 17, my biggest accomplishment was skipping classes without getting caught. But the million dollar question is, how does he do it? And I know, I know, it's lots of hard work. He studies a lot. He has big names supporting him. All of this is completely true and needless to say. But you see, what sets Gukesh apart from all other players and catapults him to superhuman status is how strong his mind is. The guy has a super sturdy and resilient mindset and there's no game better to showcase this superpower than the heartbreaking match against Firuja on the seventh round of the candidates. Let me set the stage. Firuja is coming from two losses. He needs to win. But Gukesh had the chance to reach first place in the tournament if he wins wins this game. Both players really needed to score. So this is the board that Gukesh was seeing. He was playing with black. Firuja here is on the ropes. He only has three minutes left on the clock. Now this is a very trick position because if he takes with the pawn, yeah, he holds the knight, but then there is an x-ray attack on the b-pawn. And then the b-pawn will fall, then the bishop will fall, there's the f-pawn. He cannot do that. He can't take with the rook as well because then the knight will fall. So Gukesh can't really take that pawn. But Gukesh is a monster here. He finds knight f2. That's a brilliant sacrifice. And the whole idea here is that after all the captures, when the bishop arrives, the knight is spinned. And once that is captured, he has two pass pawns. It took him 45 seconds to make that call. Firuja now has less than three minutes to make 12 moves. Rook e4, rook d8 by Gukesh threatening to grab the horsey. Bishop e3 adds a defender. Bishop c5 adds another attacker. This is it. That Firuja is done. Okay, come with me. One, two, three defenders on the knight. And one, two, three, four attackers. You cannot add more defenders, the knight will fall. But then, a French freaking miracle. Firuja was tied on time, about to lose a piece, and he finds queen b3. That was the only move, everything else, and the knight dies. It looks like the knight is hanging, but it's actually not. 
After we trade and you capture the queen, I capture the rook with a check. And then the bishop falls, and now there is a huge mate threat. How, how do you even stop that? That's a brilliant move by Frugia, and Gukesh just sees all of this and trades the queens. And then suddenly the game's back. I mean, Frugia is completely out of time, but the game's back. But there's still time, and Gukesh wants blood. A5! He wants the candidates. Rook on the seventh. That has to be bad news. It's always bad news. The B pawn's falling, the F pawn's falling, but Gukesh doesn't care. A4! Now knight c5 protected by the rook and attacking the pawn. Gukesh goes to rook a8. He needs to push that pawn. Gukesh has two minutes. Ferruja has only one. We have five moves left before the additional time. Five moves for one minute. The b pawn is not protected, but Ferruja finds knight d7. There is a fork on b6. But now Ferruja only has 36 seconds to play four moves. I don't even know if that's physically possible. Like, we're playing over the board here. One has to think, one has to pick up the piece, one has to annotate the moves. Like, they're playing bullet chess over the board. But the time is also pressuring Grikesh. He has to make a move, and it has to be a really good one. King h7, and then, wait, what? King, King h7, that's a mistake. Rook f3, not the fork, but Rook f3. Ferruja is a maniac. He has less than 30 seconds and he's ignoring the fork, he's ignoring the pass pawn. He wants to put both rooks on the 7th rank. What do you do here? You're good cash. You have 20 seconds on the clock. What do you do? There's a saying in poker that a player can go on tilt after they make a bad mistake, and they keep repeating the same mistake over and over again. And Goo Cash went on tilt. All he can think about is promoting the pawn. He can only think about that. A3, oh my god, A3, another blunder. Rooks are now on the seventh, eight seconds on the clock. King H8, Ferruja goes knight F8. Knight just seats and it will be made. Goo Cash, you gotta watch out, man. A2, A2, oh no. Knight G6. Check. It's over. It's over. Gukesh resigns. What happened? He he had the game on his hands. He, he had the pass pawn. The tension and the heartbreak of losing this game? You gotta watch it for yourself. If I close my eyes and put myself in Goo Cash's shoes, being watched by millions of people, analyzed by experts, my heroes, trying to be the proud of my family and my country, and losing a match like this, it's heartbreaking. If I'm in Goo Cash's shoes, trying to recollect myself after losing such a traumatic way, the only thing that I can imagine saying to myself is, I don't know, uh, you did your best. Maybe some other time. You're too young. Maybe a little bit more mature. But Goo Cash is not me. Goo Cash is not a normal human. Look at what he said about this game. But the moment where I really felt, uh, felt at my absolute best and I and I thought um, things can go really well was uh, the rest day after the loss against uh, Ali Reza. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So after that game, I, I mean, I was, I was upset for, for a while, but already in the rest day, I felt very good uh, physically, mentally, and just by I felt very sharp. And um, yeah, after that, I think I was pretty confident that uh, I have a lot of chances for 
How can he just recollect himself like that? How can he be so focused and humble and confident all at the same time? Instead of losing his mind, he finds it. Everybody is surprised and curious how he manages that. He tries to explain to us, mere mortals, how does he do it? And he says things like he practices sports, do yoga, tennis, for example. He tries to keep a good mood and a cheerful mindset. But as any other superhero, it's difficult for him to explain something that comes just naturally. Uh, chess is so complex, so I just love it. Yes. The most important quality is to just enjoy chess and uh, be confident all the time and never give up. And it's even more difficult for us to grasp the essence of the superpower. And he had a rematch. A rematch against Ferrugia on the second to last round of the candidates, where he had the opportunity to use all of his superpowers. Gukesh has to face his demons again, and this time the stakes are higher. If Gukesh wins, he is the leader of the candidates, one round to the end, with a gigantic chance to become the youngest winner of the tournament to make history. But if he loses, the dream is over. Just go home. All eyes on him. Gukesh will face the Brilliant Defense here, and it's already very clear that Ferrugia wants to draw. The Brilliant Defense is used when Black really wants to draw a match. You see, all that Ferrugia wants is to not lose. He's not gonna win the candidates, but for sure he doesn't wanna give the tournament on a silver platter to Gukesh. And we'll see this pattern happening over and over again in this game. Ferrugia proposing a draw to Gukesh, and Gukesh saying no. But Gukesh here really needs a win, so he's gonna play D3. That's called the anti-Berlin, and it's gonna avoid any main lines of the Berlin defense. Castle, and knight D4 is Ferrugia already trying to dry up the board. They make the exchanges. Knight D2, C6, Bishop C4, D6. The position is pretty solid so far. Gukesh needs to keep an active game. C3 touches the bishop, bishop slides back to B6. Gukesh slides the bishop back to B3, and the idea here is that he wants to break the bishop pair from Ferrugia, but Ferrugia says no way man, he goes A5, and the idea is to bring the bishop back to avoid any trades. And so it happens, the knight comes, the bishop slides back. Now Gukesh moves the knight again, back to E3, and this is already a bit risky. It blocks the bishop within the structure. But then there are ideas of queen F3 and then knight F5. This is all Gukesh trying to be as aggressive as possible. He needs to win this game. Ferrugia castles, and yeah, the queen comes, but now Ferrugia drops a bomb. D5. This is already a pretty neat move from Gukesh, and it sounds weird, it sounds like he's losing a pawn, but count with me, there is one, two, three defenders of the pawn, and one, two, three, and four attackers. It looks like is gonna lose that pawn, but it's actually a very tricky move. The idea here is that if Gukesh captures a deep pawn, what will actually follow is a4. That will remove the bishop, that's one of the attackers of the center pawn, and Ferrugia will capture it back and have a very strong center. But our boy G is sharp as a knife, he sees all of this and moves the bishop to c2. g6 now controls any horse jumps to f5. Rook e1, bishop e6, these are just pieces developing. Gukesh now has to give the center to Ferrugia, but this is quite risky. His bishop is still locked. Gukesh needs to solve this ASAP. H3, and now the idea here is quite refined. He wants to bring the knight back, opening for the locked bishop, without having to worry about any attacks on the queen with the bishop. Rook e8, bishop a4 immediately attacks the rook. But Ferrugia is inspired, man. What is more available than a rook? A queen. E4. A couple of pawn captures, but the queen's still in danger. Gukesh slides back the queen, and now Ferrugia finally moves the rook. Now Gukesh has continued with his plan and moves the knight to f1, opening up for the bishop, but this actually brings problems. The knight was guarding the c4 square. Now that is a very juicy square for Ferrugia's bishop. Now queen c7, that's the best move. It's preparing the bishop to go to c4. Now this is so dangerous, once the bishop's there, Ferrugia can trade it with a knight, bring the other bishop back, and there is a mate coming. Oh my god. Gukesh defends the c4 square, you gotta protect that square at all costs. But dude, Ferrugia's on fire, a4, that's insane, he's given up the pawn, but it's the same idea, he wants to deflect the bishop out of c4, Gukesh cannot allow that to happen. Okay, you gotta see this variation. If Gukesh captures the pawn, everything will break. The bishop comes to c4, will deflect the queen two times, take the knight, the rook locks the king, now the bishop slides back. 
The queen is now an intercontinental ballistic missile pointing at Duke Kesha's king. You need to defend with g3, but then e3. You're now forced to take with the bishop, but now a rook sacrifice and the king is out of defense and it's mate. Trust me, Gukesh went god level and saw all of this. He refuses the free pawn, trades the bishop, and ooh, that was a close call. And at this time, Nipo and Akamura had just tied their game. Gukesh knew this. He was playing his game, but he knew this. If he managed the win here, he would lead the candidates. I have a theory here. I think that Nipo and Akamura went for a quick tie, imagining that Gukesh wouldn't take big risks on this game, taking everything to the last round of the tournament. Ah, he's so young, he's just a kid. He'll feel the pressure and play passively. But our boy G is thinking the opposite. He's thinking, this is it. This is my chance. It's all or nothing. Let's do this. Finally, Gokesh's bishop joins the game. A3 by Frugia. C4 controls the horsey. Knight H5 and Frugia comes with another scary plan. F4 and then F5, everything's gonna break on the way. And now G3 by Gukesh defends against a knight. Frusha brings his bishop to a more central square. Now B3 gives a bit more structure here on the queen side, adds a defender to the C pawn. And the idea here is that in the future, maybe Gukesh can promote one of these pawns because there's a majority here on the queen side. But Frusha doesn't wait, drops the bomb. F4, shit is about to hit the fan. Gukesh needs to simplify things ASAP. He trades on C5. Brings the rook to the open file. But Frugia is unstoppable. Rook f8. He wants to play f4. He's pounding on the table and screaming, say, I will play f4. Rook d5. Queen retreats to e7. Gukesh stares back at Frugia's eyes and says, If f4 is so important, I'll play it myself. The king will come to guard the h pawn. The knight will come to block the e pawn. The other rook will come back to life. This is unbelievable. This is the only good move for Gukesh. It's the only move that holds everything together. I dare say that Gukesh's entire candidate's campaign is defined by this move. It's bold, it's aggressive. I'm telling you, years from now, people will look at this move and say, holy shit. Now Frugia circles back the knight, attacks the rook, rook d2, g5. This is another sneaky move by Frugia. He wants to remove the defender of the e5 square. He wants to maneuver his knight all the way back and then all the way forth, all the way to f3. Like Gukesh cannot allow that. But my boy Gukesh is cold, man. He's cold. He's like, sure, go on, take on f4. I'll take on f5 and attack your queen on the way. They traded in f4 anyways. And now Frugia goes to queen f7. And now there's another trap by Frugia. Gukesh cannot capture the pawn. Because if he takes, there is a check and he loses the knight. He cannot do that. Frugia's running out of time. King h2. And now the f pawn is at risk. But Frugia goes knight h5. That's so good. It attacks the f pawn and also defends the f5 pawn by the queen. Gukesh defends with queen f2. Rook g6. Rook d5 adds another attack to the f pawn, and that pawn will fall. But now Frugia finds a move with the knight and defends it. That's the only move. And here, both players repeat moves. They both need those extra 30 minutes on their clocks. Rook back to g1. I mean, what? Frugia's all good with the draw here. Rook back to g6. If Gukesh moves his rook back, the game is over. It's, it's over in a draw. But my boy G here calculated everything. He said, hell no. Only one of these guys are going to be left standing after this match. Queen h4. The rook can't go back. They trade. King h8 prepares for rook g8. Gukesh hides his king. Rook h8 is here anyways. Anything can happen from now on. Queen g5. Gukesh wants to win that pawn at all costs. And Fuja goes queen g6. He's saying, okay, dude, let's play this end game. This is it. It's gonna be a fist fight. Gukesh's rook goes for the g-pawn. Fuja's trying to go on scramble mode, man, and goes for the active defense. Rook e8. The g-pawn will fall, but Fuja's knight will live to live another day and targets the f-pawn now. Gukesh moves up the knight, but the knight actually is looking back to defend the pawn. Knight d4 by Fuja. Rook b6, and the b-pawn is now falling. Both players are on time pressure. Fuja has four minutes and wastes three minutes calculating. Four minutes, and he wastes three minutes on the next move. Knight c2. Oh my god. He's saying, okay, go on. Take, take on b7. Now, e3 with the checks coming, bro. It's game over. I'm gonna promote. And Gukesh fell for it. Rook takes b7. Rook takes b7. Wait, what? Why? 
And then Gukesh looked at Fruja and said, you miscalculated, bro. You missed it. And Fruja finally saw it. He can't move his pawn. He can't move his pawn, otherwise it's mate. It's e3 check, king d2, knight d4 check, king d3, and if you tunnel vision and go for a2 to promote, you catch as knight f6. That is mate on the h7 square. You gotta stop this. Gukesh is on god mode and calculated all of this in less than two minutes. Two minutes. Rook e6. Fuja has to defend against that crazy mate. Gukesh now tries to drive the board. Fuja cannot trade the rooks. There are too many passed pawns. Rook h6. Both players have one minute on their clocks. They're now playing bullet on the candidates. C5. Gukesh goes all in with a pass pawn. Knight d4 comes back to stop. The king comes back to defend the h pawn. Check with the rook. King comes back. Fuja goes back for the h pawn. This is also a dropper position. Gukesh says no again. B4. Gukesh is giving up the h pawn so he can move up his pawns to promote. The king touches the rook. Fruja slides back to h6. Look at Fruja's knight here. He's like a freaking pegasus. He's blocking both pawns to move forward. Rook b7. Now the b pawn can move forward. Fruja is now on the ropes. He brings his king to help. b5. King f8. b6. And now the pawn is only two squares from promotion. Fruja is now officially desperate. Rook g6 check. King f2. Rook h6. He's gonna try to infiltrate through the h2 square. Rook c7, opening for the pawn. Rook h2, check. King g3, touches the rook. And finally, finally in this position, Fruja abandons the match. There is nothing else he can do. The pawn will promote anyways. What a god level win. And then Gukesh grabbed the king, raised over the board, and then dropped. Oh my god, that was loud. It, it was supposed to be like a mic prop, but okay. <laughs> We're gonna cut this, right? Gukesh will then go on to the last round of the candidates against Nakamura to hold his leadership. And thanks also to the nail-biter crazy match between Nepo and Fabiano Caruana, that is probably one of the insaneest matches I've ever seen in my life, but it's a matter for another video. Anyways, all of reference to Gukesh in India, the cradle of chess that is becoming the headquarters to a fruitful young horde of chess geniuses. Hi, and while I have you, if you want to do a deep dive into the crazy life and mind of Hikaru Nakamura, Gukesh's last opponent, check out this video. Tem nem aí, não tá falando. Não, só tô embaralhando.